why Diana would be especially thrilled for, her favorite, son Harry and wife Meghan, the truly independent woman she yearned to be, writes Richard K. 35 years ago, Australia transformed Princess Diana from shyly to global star. It brought us the birth of Demania and every time she went back she had the same spellbinding effect, in good times and bad. Now the Bami Antipodean heir is working its magic all over again this time on her son Harry and his pregnant wife Meghan, as they began their first full day down under yesterday, a pair of butterfly earrings and a gold bracelet glistened in the sunshine, jewelry worn by the Duchess of Sussex that once belonged to Diana. The significance cannot be overlooked as Harry conjures up new ways to ensure that the spirit of his mother is with the couple in public and in private. Meghan also has with her on this trip the square-cut aquamarine ring she wore on her wedding day for the evening reception at Frogmore House which, I can reveal, was a gift Diana received on the day her divorce from Prince Charles became final in 1996. It was given to her by diplomat's wife Lucia Flecka de Lima, one of her closest friends, who bought it to replace the engagement ring Diana no longer wanted to wear once her marriage ended. The stone came from the same mine in San Jorge de Lima's native Brazil which has provided aquamarines for the queen. It was not just Diana who enjoyed a special link with the generous Lucia, so too did William and Harry. When she visited Kensington Palace she always brought something for the boys. If it was money, it was often a £50 note. Ooh, a pink granny. The boys would exclaim excitedly, a reference to the Queen's head on the bank note. Harry never forgot such kindness and, when he and William were making their plans for a statue of their mother as a permanent memorial, they saw the views of S.R.A. de Lima. Sadly, she died last year before the project could be completed. But both boys knew how much she meant to their mother during the years she was in London as the wife of Brazil's ambassador to the UK and later in Washington when he was appointed envoy to the U.S. Diana would often talk to Lucia and other friends of her precious boys, but particularly of Harry. She adored them both but William, destined to be king, was marked from birth for special attention. As compensation, Diana poured more love and attention into Harry. I have to, she would often tell me. Charles and I worked so hard to ensure both boys receive equal amounts of our time and love, but others in the family seemed to concentrate on William. One day she told me how matters had come to a head with the Queen Mother, with whom the princess had always had an ambivalent relationship. Harry had complained that whenever he and William visited their great-grandmother at Clarence House, it was always William she made a fuss over and who sat next to her. It's not fair, Harry told his mother. Diana took it up with the Queen Mother explaining, as delicately as possible that she would prefer it if she didn't show favoritism to William. For her part, the Queen Mother argued that as William was heir to the throne he should be groomed as such. However, things did change a little. More than anything Diana didn't want Harry to have a complex about his position in the family. She need not have worried, although slower at learning than William and more sensitive. Harry was a happy-go-lucky boy with a streak of curiosity. William, on the other hand, was slightly aloof and this made him a little more serious and retiring. Diana empathized with her eldest son's predicament. He doesn't want his every move watched, Diana would say. Whereas Harry's attributes, she felt, were better suited for royal duty. She came up with the nickname Good King Harry, GKH for short, which she shared with a handful of friends. How Harry loved it when he was alone with Diana at Kensington Palace. Once, when home ill from boarding school, he gleefully told one of Diana's friends, I have got mummy to myself, and I don't have to share her with William. Quite how many of his childhood memories from the palace nursery Harry will recall as he becomes a father himself, remains to be seen. But there is one quality he is bound to want to replicate. Diana ensured that the domestic staff and police referred to the boys only by their first names, not as prince and never as your royal highness says her friend Simone Simmons. She knew they need to have a little dose of reality. She smothered them in love and tried to give them an education outside the classroom, hence those visits to the homeless and the sick during their childhood. But for all her efforts how heartbreaking it was to hear Harry recall last year of the times after his parents' breakup when we never saw our mother enough or we never saw our father enough. All the same, 
Diana considered motherhood to be her greatest achievement. As the years pass it is harder and harder to visualize the beautiful young woman who died at 36 as a grandmother four times over, but how she'd have loved to have imparted some of her wisdom to the women who married her sons. She would, of course, have understood Kate's wish to have her own capable mother, Carol Middleton, on hand for the arrivals of George, Charlotte, and Louis, and installed as Granny Number 1 but it may have been impossible to keep her out of the nursery after Meghan gave birth. For Harry will be fulfilling a desire his mother once held, becoming parent to a mixed-race child. Diana's dream was to have a baby with Hasnad Khan, the kindly Pakistan-born heart surgeon with whom she fell in love after watching him operate at London's Royal Brompton Hospital. And if it was a girl so much the better. For Diana this was no idle fantasy. She believed a child with Muslim Khan could have far-reaching implications for the world. It would help, she reasoned, bring the Muslim and Christian worlds closer together. It is tempting to wonder also how Diana would have handled the tragedy of Meghan's father, the shock of his collusion with a photographer prior to the wedding, the embarrassing interviews and his isolation from his daughter. She treasured her own father and despite several significant differences, they never fell out. When Earl Spencer died suddenly at 68 in 1992, she was heartbroken and many have wondered if his absence helped precipitate her split from Charles that year. Her friends believe Diana would have been on the first flight for a rendezvous with Thomas Markle at his Mexican border hideaway to broker a reconciliation. In many ways, Meghan is the young woman Diana yearned to be whose successes and achievements she earned for herself, not through marriage into the royal family. Despite the global fame it brought her, it was only after her split from Charles that she found a way to use that celebrity and turn it into a meaningful role. But no role would surely have surpassed that of grandmother.